Good morning, North Hills. Good to be with you guys this morning. My name is Zach Schiffer, your lead pastor here. And today we are going to be talking a little bit about this upcoming year as, our, as we uh, plan for our church, as we set goals for our church. And so we're going to get down to some practical things, some, some stuff you can be looking forward to that myself and, and staff are working on, things that we want to invite you into, that we need help as we work together as a church to build upon the foundation we have and, and look towards a glorious future. But as always, we start with Scripture. We have to set up our minds to be prepared for the work that God has for us to do. Last Sunday was glorious. It was our worship time at Easter where we remember our risen Lord. And as Jesus walked out of the grave, he gave us this commandment to go make disciples, to answer the question for us, what's next? And so that's on my mind. It's, it's part of where I'm at these days, right? What is next? And we're building um, goals around what is next as a staff. And we want to tell you about those so that we as a church, not just a few people that, that do this full time, but we as a church, the family of God can be in this together, looking forward to what's next for us as a church. Now, let me tell you a little bit about what went down this week uh, for me. I'm exhausted. I had a long, busy week, worn out, and this is one of those moments where I had a message prepared, I had done, done my homework, had my notes, and God said, hold on, tap the brakes. Stop right there. We got something else to talk about today. And that's where we're going today. That's the scripture we're going to look at today. Because this isn't about what we do. We're not, we're not a faith of works. And so God was refocusing my mind on where we're going, on what's next. Let's pray together. Father God, thank you so much for today. We thank you for speaking to us for being present in our lives, for directing us, and we pray that every day we are listening to you. Father, I'm excited about the year ahead. I'm excited about joining you in your work. And so I pray that you speak to each of our hearts today as we look at your word, as we look at this letter to us from your heart so that we can understand your heart for us. We can understand this journey we're on. We can understand where you want us to be. We love you, Lord. And we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Okay. What I'd like to do is I'd like to turn in your Bibles to John chapter 15. So turn on your Bible if it's a digital device uh, and get get scrolling to find that. If you're with, the, uh, with me in a paper Bible, like I'm standing before you here today, turn towards the back, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and then the final gospel, John, and find John chapter 15. This, if I can set it up while you're looking, this scene, this story, this moment with Jesus happens right after his Passover, his last supper with his disciples. He has just told Judas, whatever you need to do, go and do it quickly. And so now he's talking to his inner tribe of guys. He's talking to the, those people who are closest to him, these young men who are gung-ho, who are looking forward to God's kingdom come, who are zealous for him, He's talking to them directly right here. This is behind closed doors. This isn't a sermon to the masses. This is to, to his close inner circle. And he stands up from the table at the end of chapter 14, and he says, come now, let us leave. And so picture with me, they were in the upper room, Last Supper, it's dark, the city is probably very quiet at this point, or at least the streets don't have much traffic on them. Maybe there's, maybe there's joyous laughter and noise as other people are potentially you know, celebrating the Passover and they can hear that going on. But the streets are probably pretty quiet. 
and Jesus takes them on a hike. They're going to go up out of the city to the Mount of Olives where he will be betrayed later this night, and Jesus has to tell his guys some stuff. And, he, and, and really, he's reminding them of things they should already know. But he's speaking to them so that they're prepared for what's next, okay? For what's right around the corner. And so he tells them this story. I'm gonna, we're going to read from chapter 15, verse 1, all the way through verse 11 here in one chunk. And then we'll turn back around and we'll dissect it piece by piece, all right? Let's read it together. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean, but because, sorry, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself, it must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away and withers. Such branches are picked up, thrown into the fire and burned. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is to my Father's glory, that you bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. As the Father has loved me, so have I loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. It's a great piece of scripture right here. If you noticed, there's this, this phrase, remain in me. I'm reading from the NIV and it's repeated over and over and over again, probably like at least seven or eight times in this little section that we just read. It's a powerful phrase. That's why it's used over and over again. It's a powerful phrase. In other translations, it uses the word abide, like abide in me as I abide in you. And it's powerful. As I was preparing this message, and I said I had another message ready to go. I had done my research and stuff, and today I am tired. I'm worn out. And as I was praying over this message in preparation to finally Step, step up here. The Holy Spirit was talking to me and, and brought this to my mind. Scripture buried in our hearts can be used by God. That's why scripture memorization is so cool. And he just said, hey, hey this is what you need to focus on today. And it rocked my world. It rocked my world because I was tired and all I'm thinking about and what I'm preparing to talk to you about is the work we need to get done, what we need to get down to business working on. It's not the topic you really want to talk about when you're tired, when you're feeling like all I really need is a nap right now. And, and it was like the Holy Spirit met me in this place and he almost nourished my heart saying, it's okay, I will give you rest. So let's look at this to see what I'm talking about, okay, as I remember this passage. We're going to break it down almost verse by verse. I am the true vine, and my Father is the gardener. So imagine Jesus being a grapevine, okay, and God is the gardener. There's roles that they're going to play here. Verse 2, he, being God the Father, cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. This is, what, this is what a gardener, a vintner would do, is that something's not bearing fruit now that that plant is expending energy. It's moving minerals and moisture and sugars up through the trunk 
and sending it out to branches. And if that branch of the plant is not bearing fruit, then it's wasting that energy on leaves and growth of that wood substance that is not producing any of the fruit that is the, 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 the goal of this plant. And so the gardener does what? He cuts off those branches, the ones that are not serving their purpose, right? He cuts them off. He removes them from the vine. They're no longer connected to the trunk which produces the nourishment that all these branches need. The branches in this story represent people like us. Okay, but there's another branch. There's a branch that does bear fruit, but look what he does. He also takes the clippers, the knife, the sickle, to that branch as well. He prunes that branch. He cuts that branch back, not off, but he cuts it back so that it will be even more fruitful. Have you ever felt like life was just rough? Have you ever felt loss? Maybe where something was removed from your life, taken away, you no longer have that relationship with somebody who you dearly loved. Maybe you really loved that job and now, you know, it's the, the market changed and you no longer can run that business or do that job because it's no longer profitable, it's no longer needed and you have to switch careers and find something new and you experience loss. There's something that's removed out of your life, right? It's pruning sometimes. Sometimes the hardships we experience are God-ordained because he has a better plan for us, because he has more planned for us, because this analogy is rich. If we think a little bit deeper about this, when a plant is pruned, when it's cut back strategically, like near the bud of, of some new leaves, what happens within God's design for a plant is that that plant actually then creates hormones that flow to that spot that stimulate new growth. So every, every branch that is cut back will often stem into multiple branches that will sprout forth from that place. And if a branch already kind of has the genetics and is getting the nourishment and food to be, to be a fruitful branch, if that branch then is cut back, that gardener has now just multiplied the ability of that branch to produce more fruit. And the plant, the trunk of the plant, knows to send, with this hormone now, to send even more nutrients, more, more of the natural water and sugar and minerals and things that this plant needs to that branch because that branch is tied into the source of life. When the gardener prunes that branch, the trunk also responds in support of that branch and creates even more potential for fruit, even more potential for life. And you see, and so pruning, although difficult and hard and painful, often is an act of love from God the Father. When he's taking away the things that maybe distract us or the things that don't have the best possibility for a future for us, and he says, I have more in store. I have more planned. Or maybe you're walking on the right path, seeking after him, and he says, I no longer need you stationed there. I've got new work for you to do, and I'm going to move you and station you here because you will be even more fruitful in this position, in this ministry, in this neighborhood, in this job, in this family, right? And so he may move you. He may reposition where you're at. Let's read on. Verse 3, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. This is speaking about preparation. Uh, back then the, in Jewish times, the, the, the gardener would actually clean the grapes and wash them, preparing them. And God says he's given us his word in order to prepare us, that we're already clean and ready for something, right? We're ready for something. We are being prepared. Verse 4, remain in me 
as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. A lot of that remain in. A lot of that you could substitute abide in. But I looked up this word. Jared and I talked about this word. We, we researched and explored. And the, the word in, in the original Greek was meno, which meant to, to rest. It meant to sojourn. It had this connotation of you're on a journey. There's somewhere you're going to, like growth, right? Like our eternal hope in heaven. But there are moments, little, little turnoffs along the way where we, we can rest, where we can stop for just a little while and be rejuvenated. See, it's, it's the opposite of striving. You're, you're still talking about I'm on the journey, but you're not by your own power trying to strive forward and make something happen because you're remaining in the vine. You're remaining in the source, tied into the source that gives you life. So often, we try to run out ahead of what God is doing. We try to make our own plans and make something happen when God is saying, remain in me. Rest in me. See, God is the one who ultimately leads us in the ways of righteousness. He's ultimately the one who leads us through life if we will follow him. And at this time in history, there were these rabbis, these teachers who would you know, hike around and teach a lot of people about their faith and things like that. And they would have followers, disciples, who wanted to learn from them. But if you ran ahead of your rabbi down the road, you're not hearing what he's talking about. You're not experiencing the examples he's, he's making along the way. You're not uh, um, understanding where he's even headed. You might reach a fork in the road and he goes one way, but you've missed it because you're already too far ahead down another road. And so there was this concept of being covered in the dust, by the dust of your rabbi's sandals. That, that you were to be a follower, following your rabbi so that you could hear his voice, listening, understanding, experiencing him, and growing because of it. And it required some restraint. It required some intentionality. It required even a little bit of planning because you might need to wear the right clothes or bring the right food with you or something to go on the journey. But you remained with the rabbi. You sojourned with the rabbi. You, you were rejuvenated, encouraged, rested up in his presence. Verse 5 says, I am the vine, Jesus being the vine. You are the branches. If you remain in me, you're sojourning, you're resting, you're traveling with, but never ahead, and I in you, if we're in Jesus' presence, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. If we get overambitious and we're trying to do everything on our own, it will all amount to nothing. Verse 6, if you do not remain in me, you are like a branch that is thrown away. Remember, it's cut off from the, from the trunk. It's not remaining in the trunk anymore. It's cut off. It's thrown away, and now it's not connected to the source of life anymore. And so it withers. Such branches are picked up, and they're thrown into the fire and burned. This imagery is amazing, right? Jesus is the vine. He's the source of life. We talk about this of like, in our walk with God, death has entered the world because of sin, and because of sin, we've been cut off from God. We've been We've been disconnected from the source of life. And Jesus died on the cross for our sins, to, to atone for our sins, to redeem us so that we could walk with God 
so that we could tie back into, be grafted into the source of life. But when we try to do it on our own, we wither. When we try to do it on our own, we, we just die, and that's the end. We're, we're turned into firewood. We're on our, you know, on our way to the fire, fiery gates of hell, and to dust we will return. It's just, it just peters out. It just becomes the end. It doesn't amount to anything. Verse 7, if you remain in me, again, abide, if you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. This is the process. We spend time with God in his word. These are his words to us, right? And we spend time in prayer. We ask. We spend time in prayer with God to remain in him. So often when we're hurting, when we're tired, when we're dissatisfied with life, when we're scared, we go running off somewhere else. We go running off somewhere else to something else, right? We try to fill the hole inside with success. We try to fill the hole inside with substances or other relationships. And last week, we, or in the Passover series, we talked about repentance being this act of returning to this act of turning away or returning to God. Returning back to him because, where, because that's where we find our rest. That's where we find our value. That's where the hole in our heart gets filled. That's where we find a relationship that's worth having, right? That's what we need. And now it's saying to stay there to remain in there, that we wouldn't be like a child walking along with a parent who gets distracted and runs away. It says, remain, remain with me. That's where we will find our rest. Jesus said that his, his burden is, I mean, his, his yoke is light, um, that he's not going to heap heavy burdens on us because he's going to carry our burdens. He carried our burdens to the cross for us. And then it says, this is to my Father's glory, that us remaining with him will glorify God. When, when we spend our lives with Jesus, it will glorify God, and it will glorify God that we bear much fruit, showing yourselves to be my disciples. What is this fruit? This fruit is our lives poured out for others. It's the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, kindness, like all these things, right, that are beautiful. You can go look those up in Galatians. They're beautiful things. This is, this is the grapes. This is the fruit, the results of living life with Jesus. Last week, we talked about our great commission, the, what, the, the what's next, our mission to go out and make disciples. But what does that mean? As we think about our future, what we should be doing, what does that mean? If we're to remain with God, what does that mean? Turn with me to Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I'm going to actually read it to you guys, um, not from the NIV, but from the message version. Because uh, Jared pointed out to me that it, that, it, that it speaks so well to this point of what does it mean to remain in him? What does it mean to make disciples? What does it mean to, to walk with Jesus? And this is what Romans 12, 1 and 2 says from the message version. And I'm reading it off of a little piece of paper here. So here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday, ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well-adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You'll be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. 
I'm going to read it again in NIV real quick here. It says, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. What this is saying is that we're on this journey, and if we are to remain in him, remain in God, that, that we will start to bring every element of our life, all these different pieces under the authority, the lordship of Jesus, that we will give it all to him and say, this is for you. How do I do this with you? How do I walk this out and remain in you? Like, you know, Lord, we're walking along a path and it's time to eat. How do I eat right here without leaving you? I don't want to go away and go find something to eat. How do I eat right here with you? We ask those questions. We ask those questions so that we can grow. We ask those questions so that we can be in his presence. We ask those questions so that we can experience all of Jesus. What is it like to eat with Jesus? What is it like to be married in Jesus' presence? What is it like to work alongside Jesus? What is it like to parent alongside Jesus? To remain in him, to abide in him, to sojourn with him. These are like exits on a freeway of like saying, oh, I've got a parenting moment. I'm going to take this parenting exit, but, but I'm going to parent with you, Jesus. In this, on this journey, we're going to have this little moment, and then we're going to, and then we're going to head on, right? The Christian life is about really a state of existence, this remaining in him, this abiding in him. Is, it's the state of our existence. And the Christian life is not an addition, like a math equation, just simply, you know, adding Christ in as like another little element, right? But it's really an exchange equation. It's about taking our misunderstanding about the world. It's about taking our way of doing things. It's about taking our, our um, hurts, right? Our, our, our faults, our 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 ideas about the world around us and exchanging them for what Christ says about us, exchanging them for a new identity, exchanging things like hurt for peace, right? Or exchanging worry for joy, right? It's an exchange. It's a change that happens within us. And so that's what this verse is talking about when it's saying like that it's, it's proper worship to give all of ourselves to God. It's proper worship to not look like the world around us, but to be transformed, to change, to look new. And we're not talking about your effort because we know that we tried to do things right on our own. We tried to be good people. And, and like Romans chapter three says that we, we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We couldn't do it in ourselves. And so flipping back to John chapter 15, we go, how do we do this? We remain in him. We let Jesus change us because we're following our rabbi, because we're walking with him instead of trying to go off on our own. We don't even have to worry about returning to him in some areas because we're remaining in him. The return is important, right? Repentance is very important, and we will drift. We will stray. But our goal, when we're talking goals, our goal is to remain in him. For chapter 15, verse 9 says, As the Father has loved me, so I have loved you. Now remain in my love. If you keep my commands, which is to love God and love others, you will remain in my love, just as I have kept my Father's commands and remain in his love. I have told you this so that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be complete. That we would experience joy, that we would be rejoicing in a relationship with Jesus is the point. It is the point. It is our goal, right? 
our goal is to go, I mean, our mission is to go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and teaching them to obey all that I have commanded you. Well, our teaching has to include this lesson of remaining in Christ, because it's not teaching them to obey by their own power and their own efforts and their own energy, because we can't earn our relationship with God. It's teaching them to walk with Jesus. That's discipleship. Teaching them to say, Jesus, what would you have me do in this situation? How do I do this to your glory? How do I love God and love others through my marriage? How do I love God and love others through my parenting? How do I love God and love others through my job? How do I love God and love others through my hurt and my pain, through my woundedness, through my, sin, my past sins that I carry with me that I just want to give over to you? How do I love God and love others through every corner of my life? every element of my life. That's what we are going to do as a church. That's the kind of disciples we're going to make. We define a disciple as somebody who's bringing all elements of their life, every piece of themselves under the authority and lordship of Jesus Christ. Somebody who is walking with him, remaining in him. That's what a disciple looks like. That's what scripture explicitly just said right here. And so as we look at our church, what are we going to do as a church? We will be intentional. We will work hard, but not running out ahead of God. We join him in the work he's doing. And so we've spent some time in prayer looking at, God, what do you want us to do in the next year? What areas of our lives do we need to bring into submission to you? How can we learn from you and say, I'm going to walk with God in these areas of my life? And one of the big ones is, how do I return to you? And so we need hope. A lot of the dark areas of our life make us feel hopeless and lost, and we need hope. And so we're going to start a ministry that I have, I have uh, experience with from my past called Hope, Help Overcoming painful experiences where we learn how to return back to Jesus and remain in him, where we can learn to shed our burdens because Christ will carry those burdens for us so that we can walk in newness and lightness and freedom in life so that we can be on a journey of joy with Jesus. We're also going to look at our marriages. Marriage is something that is hard to do, it's difficult, and it often leaves us in a state of a lot of brokenness. We often put our spouse or our marriage in an idolatry kind of position in our life where we hold this thing up to be something that it never was created to be. And so we are going to work on our marriages and we are gonna to work towards having a beautiful marriage ministry in our church that builds up marriages so that we know how to do relationships well, so that that marriage holds the correct priority and position in our life, and so that everybody that is coming into contact with us and our spouse are blessed because of the health of that relationship. This is going to impact our kids. This is going to impact student ministry, children's ministry. As, as marriages are healthier, our kids will be healthier, and we will be able to disciple our kids more effectively. And then we're going to build a family ministry where we equip parents to disciple their children, where we equip parents and teach them how to lead their children well. And I don't have all the answers of like, this is exactly how we're going to do it yet, but this is the goal. These are the goals for this year, the, the big goals. There's some smaller subset goals that the staff and I are, 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 are making as to how do we get there, right? Like what are our steps to get there? But these are the big picture goals of what we want to work towards as a church, what we want to see come about as a church. And, and this has all been um, covered in prayer, showered in prayer, where I believe we're joining God and where he is moving here. And so we won't force it. We're asking you to join me in this pursuit and when God provides the leaders like you, who he's put it already on your heart, and you come forward and say, I'm in. Let's get to work on that. 
that's one way that we see affirmation that God is at work and because he's putting it on my heart, he's putting it on somebody else's heart, and now we're going to go get to work on it. When we, when we see um, opportunities arise that we can join God in his work, we have to jump at it. And so my challenge to all of you, my ask to you today is that you would join me in prayer over these things, over, over hope, over marriage ministry, over uh, a, a family ministry programming that can teach us to disciple our children well, our kids well. If you will join me in praying over those things, God will move in our hearts. God will change our hearts and he will ask us to participate if that's really his will. And when he does ask you, because I believe he will, please reach out to me. Please email me, Z-A-C-H at N-H-C-O-G dot com. Send me an email saying I'm in. I want to be a part of these things. I want to make this happen. I want to serve here so that we can see the kingdom grow, so that we can see disciples made. We can see people learning to abide in Christ, following him in these areas of their lives, submitting to him in these areas of our lives so that we can grow as disciples of Christ. Will you pray with me to close? Father God, we thank you so much for this teaching this morning. We thank you so much for your word to us. We pray that you would continue to speak to us through your word and in our prayer time. And Father, we just desire to see you move. We want to join you in your work here. And we know that you gave us the command to go make disciples. And we understand that more and more every day as we lean in and we say, yes, Lord. Yes, I want to invest my life. I want to plant that seed and see it grow into something beautiful. I want to stay, remain rooted in you, Lord. And, and if your energy is going towards these things, Father, point me in that direction so that I may produce fruit. If there's something in our lives that is holding us back, Father, I pray that you would prune us, that you would strip those things away so that we could produce more and more fruit for your kingdom every year and that we would see your kingdom come, that we would see your will be done, that we would walk as citizens of, of your nation, of your people, of your family. And it's in your name, your glorious name, Jesus Christ, that we pray these things. Amen. Okay, guys, thank you so much. Again, my email is Zach, Z-A-C-H, at nhcog.com. Please send me an email if you'd like to talk more about this stuff. Um, I've got more details. I've got uh, a plan and some steps we're pursuing, and I'd love for you to join us in that um, because that's how a church works, that we all get in the game, that I, as a pastor, equip the saints to do the work of ministry, and uh, we are all a royal priesthood. We are all saints. So thank you for being with us today. Thank you for worshiping with us today. I love you all, and it's an honor to be your pastor. Have a great week.